Thank you for being with us today. We would love to have you join us in person. To partner with us or to give online, go to www.upperroomohio.com. We hope you enjoy this message. All right, last week kicked off a series called His presence transforms blank, and today the blank is going to be marriages and relationships, okay? So if you're married here today, or engaged, or very seriously dating into marriage, give your significant other, your spouse, a kiss right now. All right, instead of amens today, we're going to do kisses. So if you're like, man, Pastor Aaron's preaching good today, and I want to say amen, just kiss your spouse. Just give it a big sloppy kiss, and I'll be like, can I get a kiss? So if I say, can I get, instead of an amen, can I get an amen on that? Can I get a kiss on that? You just kiss. Yeah, you can do it right now. I'll give you permission to kiss in the sanctuary in public, okay? So PDA, the greatest form of PDA, public display of affection, was Jesus Christ on the cross. He was not scared to show his affection to you, but at times we're scared to show our affection to him and live outwardly for him. The same thing with our spouse. Like, I'm in love with my wife. I will make out with her in public if she would let me. <laughs> she won't. Every once in a while, I'll even go to give her a kiss, and she'll do, like, the sideways thing. I'll be like, I didn't want to kiss your cheek. I wanted to kiss your lips. But anyway, we're going to start today and, and just pick up where we left off last week. If you missed the intro to this series, I want you to get on podcast, Vimeo something, YouTube. Get that. His presence transforms mindsets was last week. It was the kickoff to this series. His presence transforms everything. It makes situations, circumstances, trials disappear. In his presence is the fullness of what? Joy, in his presence there is peace. In his presence there is rest. These are some of the scriptures we brought out about his presence. There is fruit in his presence. The same goes for our marriage. When, 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 when our marriage has his presence intertwined in it, all of a sudden our, our marriage, there is fullness of joy in our marriage. There is peace in our marriage. There is rest in our marriage. So here's the thing for today. You are in different stages of your life. Some of you aren't yet married. Some of you might be dating somebody. Some of you may be engaged. Some may be married. Some may be happily married. Some may be grudgingly married at the moment. Some may be divorced, some may be widowed, but I'm here to tell you God has a plan for you. He's got a destiny for you. He's got a perfect person for you. If, if you're desiring a spouse, the Bible's promise is that as you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll honor the desires of your heart. So if you're, if you're desiring this spouse, I'm telling you what, if you pursue God, all of a sudden you're going to look to the left or the right of you, and that person who's equally yoked is going to be running at the same pace to the same Christ that you're running to, and you're going to inherit a spouse. The thing that isn't always true is if we run towards a spouse, or we run towards this relationship, or we run towards this thing, all of a sudden we think we're going to inherit God, but it's not always the case. I'm telling you, God has the perfect husband for you. He's got the perfect wife for you. Don't settle. Do not settle. Do not compromise. All right? I'm telling you right now. And it may be like, oh, my, my clock's ticking. I got everybody else around me is getting married. I'm telling you, God has the perfect person for you. Be patient. Be still. And know he's God. Run towards God. And you're going to inherit that spouse that's going to compliment you and champion you and encourage you and do life with you and be your best friend, be your companion, be your mate for life. If we take something too early and we take something in our hands and we're like, well, we'll just do this and, you know, hopefully God will be in this. Listen, I'm telling you, it will, it will make life way more difficult. So if that's you and you're in this stage, I'm just telling you there's a plan. Now say you're to the point in life where you're not interested in marriage. You, you're done. You're widowed. We had Lola here for the 9 a.m., uh, one, one of my favorite grandmas of the house. And, and she was here and, and she's been widowed for, for over a decade now, almost two decades now. And she probably has very little interest in, in remarrying at this point in her life. But she gets to marry a man, and his name's Jesus. So no matter where you are right now, I want you to translate today's message into relationships, friendships, those of you who are married, marriages, or future marriages, or even our relationship as the bride to the bridegroom, Jesus. Like there's these promises that his presence is in our midst. His presence is with us. And his presence makes, makes everything sweeter. His presence literally transforms our relationships. 
His presence literally transforms our marriages. His presence transformed my marriage. Why? Because he transformed me to make me a better husband. He transformed me to think differently, to see Nicole differently, to see her the way God sees her, to see her beauty the way God sees her beauty, to see her as a daughter the way God sees her as a daughter. He transformed me in such a way where where she smelled different, she felt different, and I was in love. 13 years ago, atheist to revivalist in one encounter in God's presence, and it made me the man to be a man that I'm so proud of, who loves his wife, who loves his kids, and has been faithful ever since that moment, and I'll be faithful till I die. I wasn't faithful before his presence. I wasn't faithful before Christ in my life. But I'm going to get to die a man where my kids are proud to say, my dad was in love with my mom our entire lives. My dad was in love with our mom and was faithful to her and treated her like the queen that she is. That's the presence that did that to me. It wasn't, it wasn't some book. It wasn't some person. It was Jesus. It was an encounter with him that, that totally transformed me. And I'm telling you right now, that is a promise for your marriage. That is a promise for your spouse. That's a promise for your future marriages, for your relationships. That's a promise for your kids' marriages. God is a, such a big fan of your marriage, of your kids' and your grandkids' marriages. He is a big fan. Listen, in the beginning, it started with the marriage. He saw Adam in the garden. He put him in this perfect place, this paradise. And I'm telling you, Eden is still your promise in your marriage. Eden is still the place where God wants you to rest and reside and live as a married couple. It started with the marriage. Adam was lonely. So he created Eve. Out of, the, out of, out of his rib, he created Eve as a helpmate, a companion, a friend, an encourager, a cheerleader, a helpmate for Adam. It began with a marriage, and guess what? It's going to end with a marriage with Christ returning for a beautiful bride. Yeah. And everything in between is the context of marriage and relationship and the context of covenant. Listen, every relationship has three things. Thanks to Josh Haas telling me this. Intimacy, how close can we be? Passion, how fun can it be? And covenant, the commitment that we have when we sometimes don't have the intimacy and passion. Listen, that's the same promise that we have with Christ. Intimacy, how close can we be, Lord? Passion, how fun can this be? Seeing gold teeth break out in the middle of a service without even asking for it. And then commitment, covenant, that heart that's connected in a foundation that's concrete, that's there no matter what trial we go through, no matter what issue, no matter what wind, wind blows or wave crashes. All of a sudden, we have this covenant with the Lord, and he has this covenant, this promise with us. That's the marriage we're looking forward to. But he's gifted us these relationships on earth. And let me just tell you, marriage is the greatest gift of the greatest example of a heaven to earth relationship that we get to experience in the natural on earth. Listen, he even says, husbands, love your wives as Christ gave himself for the church. And he's saying, wives, submit to your husbands as the church loves and submits to Christ. And there's this relationship that happens, and it even goes to the point of one context to say, husbands, do this so that your prayers will be answered. Love your wives. Honor your wives. Give yourself to your wives the way Christ has given to the church so that your prayers will be answered. Wow. Do you think God wants us to do this thing right, men? He does. He's given us this relationship, this marriage, this future marriage for some of you to steward, but also enjoy. It's this thing, it's this responsibility that's a pleasure, not a pressure for me. Why? Because I know even on my bad days, even on my mess ups, even on my, my failures, Nicole's still going to love me. Listen, she loved me when I beat her. She loved me when I cheated on her. Now with Christ, what? it's like... I can't do anything wrong in my wife's eyes. Why? Because she understood grace, because she freely received grace, and she freely gave grace was what I needed. I got to experience Christ's grace and love through my wife. James and Brown had this beautiful story. I shared it at one of the I Still Do Marriage communities. And, and, and she said, you know, one day, you know, James is an affirmation guy, and he's close, and he always wants to meet her knees, and they're, they're, they're obviously in love. All right, can I get a kiss on that one? They're in love. By the way, if you're taking kids out and you missed that part, instead of amens today, it's kisses. 
So at any point you feel like giving an amen, just kiss your wife or, or husband, okay, or your fiance. Okay, so anyway, they were in this fight. They were yelling at each other. They were kind of this thing, and, and she was just like, I just wanted to hurt him. So she said, I hate you. And then a while goes by, and, and she comes back, and she says, you know, she's like, I, I, I'm sorry. And, and James simply says, I forgive you. That was it. The most hurtful thing that she knew she could have possibly done to him in his life was say, I hate you. Those three words. Those three words that actually mean, I wish you were dead. That's hate. Hate means I wish you were dead. So she says that to him, and he simply says, I forgive you. Listen, we were, we were given the spirit, the ministry of reconciliation. Let, let, me, let me expand on that just a little bit. Reconciliation means that we're going to bring two unlike things together, make harmony, and actually make it really, really amazing. Let me just tell you, Facebook allows little room for the spirit or ministry of reconciliation. There, there's this thing called work. <laughs> There's this thing called perseverance that we'll get into later from Paul's definition of love. There's this thing that says, you know what, Facebook's so easy, I can either, I can just disagree with somebody. Let me just tell you this, you're never going to win a Facebook argument. Yeah. Why? Because there's 2.2 billion people on Facebook with a different opinion than you. <laughs> and let me just say, Facebook doesn't create this face-to-face this, this -face encounter where, man, I have the choice here either to fight or to flight. That version is unfollow, defriend. It's like the Facebook world and generation we're growing up in is, is giving us a lack of perseverance to press in to say, no, God's given us the ministry of reconciliation. I need to make wrong things right. I've hurt this person. I actually need to say sorry. I actually need to repent. Because I was transformed by him, I actually, repentance means to, 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 to turn away from and think differently. So this reconciliation puts it on my court to say, wow, I'm responsible for this relationship. I'm responsible to steward it. But then I get to reap the benefits and the rewards and the goodness of this covenant. Let me, let me move on here. Are you liking this so far? Yeah. Let me give you the divorce stats. I'm just saying today's message is his presence is what's going to transform our marriages. His presence is what's actually going to make a dent in divorce statistics. One in two marriages end in divorce in America, including the church. One in two Christians also end in divorce. But here's astounding numbers that I found on Barna Group a couple years ago, several years ago. This is just proof that his presence, when he is the third strand on that cord, that three-chord strand that can't be broken, here's what happens. All of a sudden, when I just attend church with my family and my wife, my divorce statistic goes from one and two to one and 105. Now, if we pray and we worship together and we actually walk with the Lord together outside of Sunday mornings and we actually do a devotional together and we fall asleep in prayer together. This week, I just, Nicole was already asleep. I come into bed and, and I'm sitting there. She was asleep and I just felt like the Lord wanted to romance me. And I felt like the Lord wanted romance in our, in our relationship. And, you know, the intimacy and passion has been challenged through a house renovation. <laughs> We're kind of landing on covenant at the moment. <laughs> so she's sleeping. She's snoring. She's so beautiful, but she does snore a little bit. <laughs> this is cute little. <laughs> <laughs> so she's over there doing her. <laughs> so. So I just put Song of Solomon on Audible, on audio, on my, on my iPad, just laying next to us. And it's got the cool little music. If you do, I think the NLT version, it's got this cool narration and the music in the background. And he's like, climb up the coconut tree with the beautiful coconut. I'm like, oh, baby. <laughs> Such a romantic book of the Bible, but we overlook it so often and we just like skip over. Oh, that's, that's just a love book. Yeah, it's a love book. And we need to read that in two contexts. You need to go through that book, front to back of it, and read it in two ways. First off, in your relationship, in your relationship with your spouse. Read it. Imagine, man, this guy's full of love, full of poetry, full of, of creativity and art and the beauty of what marriage can be. And then read it in the context of me as the bride and he is the groom and he's wooing me. And he's just romancing me. And he's just, he's just calling me into this intimate relationship. Imagine the beauty of that. We get to walk in the fullness, the fullness of what Christ has promised. 
So we, we get to this place, and, and, and it's just, then we get to, if you actually worship together and pray together, the divorce rate goes from one and two to attending church together, one and 105, to one and 1,155. Why? Because presence is the glue holding you together. Christ, his spirit, it's holding you together, and that is the, the, that is the foundation that's the pillar. That's, that's the thing that cannot be broken. Listen, we, we, we come and go. Lives change. People pass away. People even leave, unfortunately. People become abusive or, or never change, at least, and we think we can change them. This is just amazing to say this is proof that God works and God is a fan of your marriage and God's presence wants to transform it no matter how good it is or how bad it is. How many believe good can always get better? Good can always get great. Listen, we don't want to be a church. We don't want to be a marriage. We don't want to be a people that just survive a, a statistic. We want to thrive. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Kiss on that one. Listen, I want to, I want to tell you about a book I'm writing. Uh, let me reword that. I want to tell you about a book that God gave me an outline for two weeks ago. I'm sitting in service. I've already been to the 9 a.m. At the 11 a.m., Steve Backlund's speaking. It's a similar message. I'm trying to listen. But then all of a sudden, God downloads this entire marriage book to me in every chapter. Can I read you the chapters? Yeah. Here's what it is. It's called To Us. When my wife and I cheers or put up, you know, like we'll have the girls. We're like, To Us. And then the subtitle is The I Still Do in Marriage. So first off is our story. Chapter 2, his perspective. Chapter 3, her perspective. Next one, there is hope. Next one, great can be better. Covenant kept us together. The value of covenant. And then the one with Josh Haas as a co-author with me. Passion, intimacy, and covenant. And then communication. How to fight fair. Love languages. Personal connection, not performance. Chew on that one for a second. Personal connection, not performance. Next one, present over perfect. What can I do to make you feel more loved? That's a question I ask Nicole all the time. What can I do today? What can I do right now in this moment to make you feel more loved, to feel more valued? That's a chapter. The love letter that changed everything. 13 years ago, prior to that encounter, I saw that, amen. Thank you. We went to this thing called Weekend to Remember. Family Life Ministries puts it on by James Dobson. And, and it's this thing, and you write your spouse a love letter. And that's your homework today. That's your homework tonight. Write each other a love letter. Just, just a mushy, gushy, good, deep love letter. If you're engaged or pursuing marriage, write your significant other. Write your spouse a love letter. It's going to change something. It's going it's to unlock something. You're going to realize why you first fell. Let me, let, me, let me correct that. We don't fall in love. If God fell in love with us, it meant it was an accident. Scott Thompson preaches this message. You don't fall in love. That makes it an accident. You choose love. So, so write a letter saying why I first chose love, why I first chose you, and why I still, why I still choose you. L let me move on here. Next one. Receive your spouse as a gift from God. Intimacy, not sex. Ending with the last two chapters, my personal favorite titles, Porn, the Silent Killer. I'll get some guys in here. Roughly, statistically, around 85% of the guys in here, 85% of the men in church struggle with the temptation of pornography. Sad. Let me just encourage you. Your wife should be meeting your needs. It's not a fantasy world that we're going to support slave and sex trafficking. They're daughters of the living God. That was part of our story coming out of that. And let me just tell you, if there's a secret thing that will destroy a marriage, it's pornography. Last chapter, my personal favorite. Oh, God, dot, 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 sex, explanation point. God has intended and, and, and actually desired for you to have the oh, God, sex. Like, it's okay we talk about this in church, okay? Like, it's supposed to be good. There's a purpose for it. There's a connection. There's a unity in it. And if you're married, he's gifted this to you. And let me just publicly define marriage. It's between a man and a woman. It's how he designed it in the garden. It's how he intends to keep it. It's being challenged right now. We love people. 
We love people who, who don't yet love themselves. We love people who don't quite understand some things. We love all people. I want to I wanna make that very clear. We love all people, but his presence transforms some things that just aren't right. And, and our definition of marriage here and what we feel the Bible aligns with is between a man and a woman. And if you're married, God intends for you to have the oh God sex. That's really amazing and pleasurable and good, but also fruitful in the connection. That where you're intimately connected and you're, you're close and your hearts are knit together, your emotions are connected, then all of a sudden you get to have the fruit of this amazing sex. So we're going to end our book with the icing on that cake called, Oh God, dot, 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 sex. How many like, would like to read that book? <laughs> Nicole, you should get on writing that. <laughs> all right, let, let's, let's move on here. I want to I wanna get to some points here. Okay. I got off course here. God, God's created us to be joined together. And how many believe that with a spouse, with a companion, even a friend, you're stronger together? The Bible even uses a context. Moses talks about in Deuteronomy, one can put 1,000 to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. I heard this story once at a wedding that this guy was a horse expert. I'm not. I'm just only repeating what he says. So if it's wrong, blame him, not me. One horse can pull, it's almost the same numbers. One horse can pull dead weight between one and 2,000 pounds. You put that horse next to another horse and harness them together, and between the two of them, they can pull over 10,000 pounds. There's something about companionship. There's something about doing things together. And there's something about that encouragement. When we're together, we're stronger together. Ecclesiastes 4 goes on to say this, 4.12. It says two, and and what? 412, but we're going to start probably around 9. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one be one alone? Verse 12, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly or easily broken. Now, now listen, I, I want to just describe something to you. In, in the fire department where I work, and I know Eli and Matt and many, a few of us in here can relate. We can relate that we do rescues. We do repelling. We do things. We're on these carabiners. We're, we're on these rigs, and we're, we're scaling walls, and we're depending on pulleys, and we're depending on, on these, these systems, and we're depending on the people holding the belays and the, the backups and the safety lines and all this, right? We're depending on that rope. All right, and, and although I'm down to 215 pounds from 274, 215 pounds, four little girls, a beautiful woman, a church, a community are depending on that rope to hold my 215 pounds. I'm sitting there, one fall, I'm done. You know, some of these centers were 30, 60 feet up in training. Some of those guys on the tech rescue team, they go like 100 feet, 300 feet. That's just not my cup of tea, all right? I'll stay down with my clipboard as a training officer and tell you how to do it. Sometimes I'm depending on these ropes, and there's different ropes, and, and the best kind are the ones that are woven together. They're the kind that have, have these materials and nylons and different things in the middle, and then they're woven around that like this. And, and have you ever seen the Chinese handcuffs? Those little paper things you put on your... And the more pressure you put on them, the stronger they get, and you can't get your fingers out. Then two days later, you lose them, or they just like rip apart, right? There's these Chinese, it's the same thing with rope. All of a sudden, when it's stretched, it's knit together like this. I want to let you know that God's promise to you, his plan for you, his plans for your relationships, your marriage, is that he is woven in the midst of you. He is one with you. He's one in your marriage. And all of a sudden, in that three-strand cord, it can't easily be broken. Why? Because together, it's stronger. Here, here's the thing in this. When we integrate him and weave him into our relationship, all of a sudden, things are being fulfilled. Song of Solomon, where, where he's wanting oneness. Ecclesiastes 4, where there's oneness. Mark 10, 9, it says, what God brought together, let no man separate. Don't you think if God's brought something together, he wants to be in the midst of that with his presence? So all of a sudden, here we are in this thing, and it's the fulfillment, even in our marriage with Christ in the middle, it becomes the ultimate fulfillment of Jesus' prayer in John 15, where he's saying, abide in me. I and you, Lord, and you and me, let us be one. And then he says, let the world, let the people see what we have. 
that we're one, we're in unity, we, we're one with this. As we, as we connect these dots and we connect from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from Paul's letters to the Gospels, to all these, this different history, all of a sudden he's, he's promising that, that this covenant, he's promising the fulfillment of these promises if we just include him. It's this thing. Let me, let me wrap something up here. Another, another visual. Although I've been on a lifestyle change since January, and I still like an occasional ice cream. All right, it's moderation now. I don't get two larges and, and then go back for some more. I kind of stick with a small now. But there's this place, because of copyrights, and I don't want to show favoritism, i got to talk about somebody other than Dairy Queen and their, their, their cookie dough blizzard where you add peanut butter to it. Oh. There's this other place that allows us to bring a little piece of heaven to earth and this glory on this marble slab that's got some frost on it. It's called Cold Stone. <laughs> there's a picture of Cold Stone. Look at that. Everybody say glory. Again, give an amen. Give an amen through a kiss right now. Just kiss your spouse. So anyway, here's the thing. Cold Stone's this really creative place to where you can do all these mix-ins and these candy bars, and they, they work it in, and they're working in the ice cream you pick out. All right? It's this beautiful thing. Without the ice cream, they're just candy bars. You get the ice cream in it. It's holding it together, making it this glorious treat. It's just like you hope it just never runs, runs out. And it's just like, I got to love it. It's like, like it, love it, got to have it. Got to have it. That's their sizes. It's funny, I love their sizes, but I will never take Starbucks sizes. Small, medium, large, please. <laughs> Tall, grande. <laughs> Grounds for Pleasure Coffee House is much better. Anyway, so it's this ice cream. It's the ice cream that's holding our marriages, our relationships together, our friendships, ones with your, your, your daughter or your son. Like, it's the ice cream of his presence that actually gives it essence. It's the ice cream that holds it together, that makes it stronger, and actually makes it more than just a candy bar I can get at a gas station, more than a candy bar I can get through a drive through like, like whatever those are called. It's like the ice cream makes it this special place, and they work it in, and it's with love. And even if you tip them, they start singing a song. It's beautiful. Listen, the Lord wants his presence to be the ice cream in your treat called your marriage. Let me, let me finish with this last point. Let's go on to 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do you know that his plans for you is always to prosper you, a hope and a future? Doesn't mean there won't be suffering. But do you know his plans are for a prosper, hope, and a future? Jeremiah 29, 11, Romans 8, 28, Ephesians 3, 20. Our promise is that he'll do far abundantly, exceedingly abundantly more than you could ask, think, or imagine. Imagine that context in my marriage, in your marriage, in your future marriage. Wow, he's going to blow your minds. Like, I believe you're going to leave this place today no matter how long you've been married He's going to blow your mind, and you're just going to be in love all over again, greater than you ever were before with your spouse. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says this, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Paul, come on, man, get it together. You tell me one point, when with the lawless be lawless. Now you're saying don't be unequally yoked to the unbelievers. Listen, there's a difference. I can hang out with unbelievers and stay true to myself. But if I become yoked or become one with them, all of a sudden there's a soul tie that's exchanged and I, I, I become one in that sense. This isn't just in the context of marriage. This actually isn't in the context of marriage. We use it at every wedding almost for that. We talk about to our teenagers, you got to be equally yoked. You run towards God and you look beside you and whoever you're yoked with, that's who's running the same pace as you. This is for all relationships. When we make a covenant with somebody and we allow somebody to actually be woven in our heart and we all of a sudden become one and now we're unequally yoked with an unbeliever who, who has some weird doctrine or weird faith or weird belief or doesn't believe in Jesus, like I can minister to them. I can bless them. I can be friends with them. I can hang out with them. We can be close. But when I make a covenant and I become one, 
or, or specifically even pre-married, become intimate and become, you know, sexual partners. All of a sudden, there's something exchanged, and that's not equally yoked. And now you pick up the bad, and maybe the good, but the bad of that other person. So, so here's the thing. I want to show you a picture like I did last year. This was a visual that kind of helped me. And we oftentimes look at yoke, and we look at it as bondage. But I want to tell you that in this context, it's actually helpful. So here's, here's a pair of oxen. And it's the same concept with the horses. When you put two together, their, their, their polling power, their work ethic, their, their perseverance, their distance they can go, the length of time they can plow and work is exponentially increased when they're together. So here's the thing with that, with that yoke, and here's why it's important to be equally yoked, and here's why it's important to pursue God together as a husband and a wife. First off, when his presence is in it, it changes everything. We've already confirmed that. But as we're working together, now this isn't a bondage holding us here to this slave work. It's actually now this, this freedom to be linked together as one, plowing and doing the work of the ministry, doing the work of the ministry in my home, in my marriage. We get to bless one another. We get to work at the same pace. We get to increase each other's output. We get to increase each other's uh, encouragement. We get to champion one another. Why? Because now we're yoked together and now we're one. Many times we've looked at this as oppressive, but actually it's freedom to say, I get to do life the rest of my life with my wife. There's no one up here. There's no one that gets the spot up here next to me the way she does. There's no one that gets to travel with me and be as close to me and minister with me in the level that she does. There's no one that gets to do life to the level we do life. There's no one that gets that access to me. There's no one that gets the, as much as you might think this is true, there's no one that gets the vulnerability level that she gets with me. Like, I share a lot with you, but I get to share my heart with her. I get to share my feelings. Through the process of this remodeling, she said something really hurtful to me. That night, I just said, make me really hurt me. I had the freedom to do that. Why? Because we're equally yoked. We're together. We're in this together. We are, we are stuck. We are peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter jelly. Peanut butter jelly. Peanut butter jelly in the baseball bat. Peanut butter jelly. <laughs> we're stuck together. And I get to share with her because I have the freedom to do so because I know she's going to love me and I know she's going to make wrong things right. So I share, man, you really hurt me. What you said hurt me. It cut deep. She's like, I know. I'm so sorry. We had a, a spirit of reconciliation to grow together. Let me, let me, let me end with this. Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, he, he talks about love. And I, I want to read that with you, and I want to just digest that for just a moment. I'm closing right now. And, and I want to leave you with this. This is not just a definition of love. It's a challenge to love in this way. Okay, I want you to know that like Paul's writing this le love letter and he's, and he's saying what love is and he's saying it's patient, kind of all these things we'll go through. And he's saying what it's not. What would the world look like if we intentionally loved to this degree? What would the people around us, what would our workplace look like if we actually loved like this? What would my marriage look like if I loved like this? Like what would that look like to be so selfless and, self and, and not self-seeking? Let's, let's go through it here. <laughs> It says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, something's happening right now. Amen that. Kiss. Something's really happening right now in this atmosphere. There's love deposits being made right now in your marriage, in your future marriage, in your relationships, even if it's with your kids or whatever. I just really feel that there's something tangible happening right now. It's hard to get through this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all men, stand with me. Have the music come. You can read that on your own. You, most of you probably know it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not self-boasting. It's not self-seeking. You know, love is not dishonor. Love is, is perseverance. Love, it goes through all these things. What if we actually love like that? But I fully believe that God's doing something right now. Why don't you just grab the hand of your spouse? 
or a friend, if you, if you don't have a spouse with you, maybe a friend you came with. I believe God's doing something in hearts. I believe he's doing something in minds right now. But I believe he's doing something in marriages. What would the world look like if we actually meant what we said the day of our wedding vows? What would the world look like if we applied this love chapter to our life, if we applied the Song of Solomon? What would it look like if, if we applied Mark 10, 9, where it says what God brought together, let no man separate, let no distraction separate, let no issue, circumstance, disagreement separate. Many a battles have been lost and won due to lack of communication or due to communication. So I pray for you. I don't know what's happening right now. But I believe you're going to leave here in love today more in love with Jesus, more in love with your spouse, more in love with your kids, more in love with your friends. And I think, I think we're going to leave here realizing that, man, His presence does give us the tools to be able to love more. His presence does give us the tools to be able to forgive more. His presence does give us the tools to draw closer to each other and actually communicate openly our feelings rather than talking about somebody behind their back. I believe you're going to leave here today that His presence is going to transform your marriages, your relationships, let me just tell you, some of you that's been through divorce, there is life after divorce. There is life after divorce. There's still plans for a hope, plans for a future for you, plans to prosper you. God wants to release you and allow you to have the forgiveness to you, but also you have forgiveness towards your ex-spouse, no matter how traumatic it was. Maybe that boyfriend, maybe that fiance. God's releasing you right now from those aughts. God's releasing you right now from that bitterness. God's releasing you right now from even the hatred. God's releasing you right now from that abuse. He's releasing it. He's, he's, he's burying it on the bottom of the ocean floor. Right now, God's doing some healing and restoration. God's reconciling some things right now. Just close your eyes with me. I'm just going to pray for a couple of different things here. Anybody who's been divorced, I just want to bless you right now. And I just want to encourage you that there is life after divorce. There is life for your kids after divorce. If this is something you've had to go through and this is something that you had to endure for whatever the reason, I just want to let you know like God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He may not have loved the divorce, but he loves you. 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 Even Joseph was tempted to, to, to divorce Mary while she was found out to be pregnant. I just want to let you know that, like, I'm not saying God is, like, a huge fan of this, but there is life after divorce. There is life after this. There is life. There is life. There is life. You have value to add. You have life to be poured out. You have love to give. And most of all, you have love to receive. You are lovable. You are lovable. You are worthy. You are not less than. God's healing you right now. God's healing you. God's healing you. He's allowing you to forgive right now. I want to pray for any pre-married people right now. There is a plan for you. There is a spouse for you. And let me just tell you, there is a spouse that's absolutely not for you. There is this 30-fold spouse. There's the 60-fold spouse. But then there's the 100-fold spouse. And let me just tell you, if you don't settle, God has a plan for you for the 100-fold return. Like he does. You might still be blessed. And, and let me just tell you, if, you've, if you're like, oh, man, maybe this wasn't the one. No, if you're married right now, that's the one. If you're married right now, we're praying 100-fold return today. Like if you're married right now, that's your lifelong partner right now. But those of you who aren't married yet, like God has the perfect husband for you, the perfect wife. He's raising them up. He's, he's giving them every trait that you need to be loved, to be cherished, to be championed in Christ. Like, like God's doing this thing right now. Just be still and know he's God. Just run towards him. Run towards him as embrace. Let him fill your loneliness. Let him fill those voids. Let him fill those needs. And I'm telling you right now, a spouse is coming. It's a promise. If that's the desire of your heart, a spouse is coming. Now I want to pray for and just kind of declare some things over the married couples here. Your best years are yet to come. Your best years are right now and forward. 
Let me just tell you, like Eden is still the promise. Eden is still the, the perfect north. Like Eden is that place and God has a plan for your marriage, a plan to prosper you, a plan for a hope, a plan for a future for your marriage. Like he has this plan for you and not just to survive, but to thrive. Will you be in love? Amen. Amen that. Like God has a plan for you. Each one of you, God has this plan. He has this plan. So just grab your spouse, hug your spouse real close. Those of you who don't have a spouse in here, hug yourself real close. Jesus is your spouse at the moment. Jesus is your spouse at the moment. Till your future one is here. And I just want you to know that like, God loves you. God loves you guys. He loves your marriage. He loves you. He's so good. He's so good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that your presence transforms us. It transforms our marriages. It transforms our hearts. It transforms our minds, our thoughts, our patterns. Our, the lies, God, it transforms us. Your presence transforms our marriages, our relationships, our friendships. God, right now, we just pray for your presence to be so divine and so powerful. Holy Spirit, come right now in marriages. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we love you so much. One last kiss to your spouse. Just a good sloppy one. All right, we love you so much. One o'clock, actually in just a few minutes, in about 20 minutes, we're gonna start the connection right out here. Stick around, we'd love to have you. We'd love to see how you can get more connected with us, how we can be more connected with you and just get to know us. We love you so much, have an amazing day. We love you, but God loves you even more.